The following podcast is not a substitute for therapy. If you are in need of coaching, counseling, or in-depth therapy, please see a qualified professional in your area. What is presented here is a guide to understanding a bit about the counseling process as it stands in relation to the practice of naturism and close free living. This is the Skyclad Therapist. Life coaching with a naturist lens, healing and transformation through clothes for you living. Good afternoon. I don't know what time of day you're listening to this podcast, but I'm recording it here in the afternoon. The sun is shining and it's pleasantly warm and I'm not really wearing anything other than the sunshine. Uh, I'm the Skyclad Therapist. I have found uh, that being clothes free has made a huge difference in uh, healing. Uh, there's an, Everyone that comes to my office has to deal with all kinds of Issues that come out of the present and the roots of those issues from the present are buried somewhere deep in their past. And all of those issues seem to become activated through life changes. Um, So when they come to therapy, people are in trouble. And what therapy does is to dive deep beneath the surface, the the present moment, and work to discover the roots, the source of the the discomfort, the dis-ease that has brought them to my office. Uh, Often the work is viewed as like peeling an onion. We go taking layer off after layer, the human has this uncanny ability to put layers on and bury trauma, emotional trauma, physical trauma, sexual trauma. We bury it under layer after layer, often even forgetting that the trauma happened at one point in time. And so we need to uncover all of those uh, let's say, wounds from the past. And it's not unlike peeling off your clothes. Okay, you, you find yourself reaching a place of honesty. And you need to be honest. Now, there are other ways to approach therapy. Um, you know, over my career, I tried an awful lot of them working with clients, and I still use so many of them, such as solution-focused therapy, where, you know, like, you have maybe six sessions at the maximum to deal with the client, to challenge the client to find a new way of being in relationship with other people. Often these are court-mandated appearances at my office. Um... Cognitive therapies, brief therapies, uh, behavioral therapies, all look to deal with the present moment and trying to suggest that we could just use our minds to recharge ourselves to find a will to go on to be functional again. Uh, because Obviously, if you're coming into the office, you're not functioning at the the best of your ability. If you were functional, you wouldn't be here. Okay. Now, part of the problem is all of these other therapies, while they do help in immediate sense, for example, uh, a man beating on his wife and has anger issues, well, he comes in, we do some behavioral tasks, and we try to change his behaviors. However, over time, that doesn't necessarily solve any issues for this man. Uh, it might solve the issue of him 
beating up on his wife, but it does not solve any other issues. Okay, why did he beat up on his wife? Like, so we need to do some depth work. And to do depth work, you've got to start peeling off layers. Layers of the psyche, defense mechanisms, uh, denials. These all help wrap us in a cocoon as if it's going to protect us from life. Uh, but it doesn't do that good of a job of protecting us because life doesn't pay attention to what we're doing so much. Life has its own agenda and its, its agenda has nothing to do with trying to uh, match what we want. Now, before I go into any kind of depth, I, I just want to just take a, a brief look at how we understand ourselves. There's something called a Johari window. It's, a, it's like taking a square and dividing it into quarters, you know, north-south axis and east-west axis, and we label each uh, quadrant uh, say along the top things that we know about ourselves and things we don't know about ourselves and then if you take a look at the the opposite axis we will have things others know about us and things others don't know about us and so we get a public self a private self a blind self and there's this huge place called the unknown self. And that is what lays waiting for us. And this is where we find ourselves tripping over life totally unexpectedly. Um, if a person comes to my office and they're relatively young and they're in the first half of life, the depth work is not very critical. We, they need the skills and the tactics to go through their daily lives. They've got to take care of their families. They've got to uh, take care of their jobs. They've got to take care of uh, various different relationships. They've, they've got to survive. Uh, but in the second half of life, basically, you know, everything changes. We have um, our careers pretty well solidly in place. Our families are well provided for. Um, we have uh, established our reputations in the community and we find ourselves struggling somehow. We've done all of this work. We become successful. It should be great, but that's it. But, why? What is the point of all of this? And this middle point, this is, it's an existential crisis of we need to have meaning for who we are. We need to have a rationale because, you know, all of these things, all of these toys, all of these accumulations and, uh, the salaries, the, you have it, but you don't find yourself that much happier. If anything, it, there's a strong level of disappointment because it didn't quite cut it. In uh, people who come to my office in the, the second half of life, they, they try all kinds of strategies to fill in what looks like to be a growing dark black hole that sucks everything out of them. Uh, I can think of some people who, who come to my office that they make it a regular point to buy new furniture for their home in hopes that that, that will inspire them. Or, you know, of course, there's the, the typical go out and buy a brand new car before the lease is up on the last one. There's no functional reason for getting a car, and 
the initial rush of getting this brand new car that smells new and everybody that you see that knows you sort of giving all kinds of compliments on this new car but that only lasts for such a short while and we're left again empty and there's something there deep within that's calling you and sort of say are you going to listen are you, are you going to go in there and find out who's calling you and what they want that's death work and I'll, i have to tell you that it's scary you know you get this call if just assume that you're walking through your life and everything seems to be just the way it's supposed to be and all of a sudden it's like somebody just stuck a foot out and just tripped you and you're falling flat on your face so what just happened everything's going so great why do you feel bruised why do you feel assaulted you haven't got a clue there's usually some triggers that go around this and Triggers that have to do with men and women and events. Um, obviously, somebody dying close to you can trigger all kinds of past associations. Um, reappearance of a, a woman who grabs your attention if you're a man. Uh, grabs your attention in a way that is really uncomfortable. It could push you away. Or it could be pulling you too close. You know, these are danger signals for a man who's who's in a relationship with another woman. So what does this mean that he's getting repelled by this woman who seems to become larger than life, or being drawn to this woman who is seems to become magical? Uh, Whenever these things happen, there's an issue that will date back to early childhood and has to do with the mother and how the mother interacted with you. And there's, you know, there's a whole wealth of ways of responding of a mother to a child and a child to a mother. But you have to remember that it really isn't what the mother did or didn't do. It is how you, when you were a child, responded to all of those things that were done or not done. And you built up a worldview and a belief system when you were so small. You didn't have an adult brain that could analyze everything and rationalize and come up with you know all kinds of explanations you didn't have any of those skills what you did have was a unique child's brain and who saw life in terms of survival literally survival what do i have to do to survive this all-encompassing mother one who's cuddling and holding and snuggling and overwhelming you with all of this attention. You're almost drowning in her attention. So who are you? You're being swallowed by this mother, this loving mother. Or you've got another way to respond. Instead of having too much from your mother, you get to not enough as a child what you feel you need. So you're grasping always, trying to hold on to a mother that seems to be a step too far away or, you know, engaged with other people and you sort of seem to be on the sidelines. And so how are you going to survive? Are you going to feed you? Are they going to protect you? And so this child builds all kinds of defenses within themselves and little rituals to ensure survival. Now, both these mothers 
are likely really good mothers. They just relate a little differently. And often there are mothers who aren't good. And there was real issues. There's, there's violence, there's verbal abuse, there's absolute neglect, there's punishments that, that torture. And survival is a real issue in those kids' situations. But as time passes, a child has all of these rituals, these little scripts that they'll act out for what is in their mind, ways to survive. And life passes. And you forget the years of childhood. You get busy with and as you grow up, you know, school fills up your time and then, you know, boys, friends and girlfriends and then a job and then meeting someone and falling in love and, and all of these different things are interacting and that past gets buried and buried and buried under layer after layer. And somewhere along the way, that little child that was buried under all of this is still there. And it is when you trip and fall on your face in the second half of life and you sort of say, why am I not happy? Why am I depressed? Why is everything I have not enough? How do you respond to that? And many of my clients respond through belligerence. Uh, they respond through addictions, uh, whether it is drinking too much, uh, gambling too much, uh, too much internet. Uh, addictions are powerful and we hope to drown out that little voice that we can't quite figure out is our own voice. We bury it. We bury it through work, we bury it through accumulation of more and more and more money, more and more power. We need so much, just like the little child needed so much. It seemed as you get older and you, this little voice is, is trying to get your attention and the only way you're responding is you you somehow become this little child grasping and grabbing and holding and, and building an, an adult layer of protection. You, know, you can't hear the voice calling. And that calling, yeah, it's a call. How do you, if you refuse it, you're going to be in trouble. Eventually you're going to fall further and further. First thing you know, you fall down the rabbit hole, just like Alice in Wonderland, and sort of say, did I just lose my sanity? Now, it's a lot of work, and it's actually a work that's going to take you know, years, but it's got to start somewhere, and it's all about starting to build a new relationship with yourself. And it's difficult. You have to start with small steps. And my practice, and of course, like I'm just the same as everybody else. Uh, I've been wounded in the past and I've had to go through, you know, counseling and, and therapy and analysis. All of those things helped. But again, they didn't quite fill in all of the holes because I was still left with, with the whole of me. Going to a therapist, we'll touch your heart, we'll touch your mind, we'll touch your soul. We'll wrestle with you, with the demons in all of those areas, but one of the things we don't do is we don't touch your body. It is as if there is no body. 
oh, you're sitting in a chair in my office or I'm sitting in a chair in somebody else's office, big box of Kleenex on a little table beside, so all of those tears that somehow to seem to erupt at the most interesting of times as a therapist it says, okay, what triggered the, the tears? So the tears are a physical response to some of the things that are emerging. And we dab away the tears and then we dive deep within the psyche trying to locate. But we don't do anything for the body. But the therapist really can't do anything for your body other than to sort of recommend good eating habits, uh, exercise, maybe go to a gym and get a personal trainer and and try to gain control of your body. Uh, sometimes refer you to a medical doctor to get you know, appropriate drug treatments, whether it's for high blood pressure or depression or anxiety. All of these are sort of like masks. They help, but they don't cure. So instead of uh, peeling off layers to, to uncover the truth, we seem to be adding on layers. It took me a long time to associate the practice of uh, being clothing free in sunshine, in nature, with healing that goes along with all of the other work. It's a risk. Taking off the clothes. You do it first at home. You look in the mirror and there's no question you're going to be totally disgusted with what you see. Uh, it's not what other people see. Remember I talked about the Johari window? You have your vision of what you see. They have their vision of what they see. They might think that you look Okay, they might even think that you look hot. It's irrelevant. When you look in the mirror, when you're in this place of desperation, what you see is not something you want to see. So you rush to cover up again. And it takes a lot of courage to sort of say, you know, I can't do that. I just find myself back in the same holes. I can't continue to hide from myself. This isn't about you know, going hanging out with a bunch of buddies in a hot tub with everyone being naked. Like This isn't the same kind of idea. Using nudity in as a healing therapy, it's something that is very personal. It can grow to have a, a social nudity component. In fact, that probably will end up being fairly necessary uh, as you deepen your own uh, discoveries of who you are, because who you are is always, you know, in relationship to, relationship with your own mind, with your own self, your own feelings, but you're, every single one of us is in a relationship with other people, whether we admit it or not. Uh, we're in relationship with family members, we're in relationships with colleagues, we're in relationships with strangers, we meet on the street and in the stores. We, we can't exist, we don't, can't begin to see ourself without having other people in it. We need people in our life to be able to get a real true picture of ourselves, to be able to differentiate ourselves from the others. Uh, I talked about the mother who totally engulfs. We call this too muchness. The child in this situation has a huge difficulty in trying to carve out an identity 
there doesn't seem to be any space for meanness for a little child. And, and part of the little rituals and scripts that a, a child in that situation will develop is layers a buffering to protect from this engulfment by a, an all-loving, all-powerful mother. It, it's, it's almost religious. If you think of an all-powerful, all-loving, all-consuming, everywhere you go, everything you see, he knows what's inside of you, he knows your thinking before you've thought it. Like, you need to put some space between you and, and this all-powerful God, or else you don't exist. You're just con totally consumed. You become swallowed up into a black hole, and all that's left is you no know, thoughtless energy. It's... It's really interesting to to try to carve out the self and when we get to midlife all the work we've done in the first half almost has to be undone in some ways so we can go back let the little child out of all of this you know bubble wrap get heard and honored and somehow along the way healed because we heal this little child within us and that heals us but it's a hard, lot of work as I said you got to do you got to strip away so many beliefs you got to strip away attitudes you got to peel off all kinds of prejudices, all kinds of uh, habits, and try to discover who are you? Who are these people who are in your life? Who is this stranger that you committed your life to? And your children? You know, like, how could you not really know them? But you find as they grow older, they're strangers. They, you know them almost intimately. You've spent so many years with them. But as they get older, and as they start to carve out their own worlds and their own identities, you're left wondering, who are these young people? No. It's what I've done and what I've said and how I've lived and, and what I believed, has it had any impact at all on these young people? Of course, you're never going to get the answers to, for that, not for a few years until they become parents themselves and they start to see some of the reflections of you in their lives as adults. But the truth is, they are unique. And you're wondering about who they really are under all of this. So are they. And that kind of helps you to take a look at yourself. Who am I underneath all of my habits? Who am I under my clothing? Who am I under my belief systems? Why do I have these belief systems? Why do I respond to authority the way I do? Why do I respond to men the way I do? Why do I respond to women the way I do? Why do I get upset? Why do I get happy? A lot of questions. Lots of questions. So you've got to do an awful lot of exposing, uncovering, to try to get answers for these questions. Well, I'm going to be coming back and again in the future another podcast and hopefully you'll join me at that time. For now, Sky Clive Robert saying goodbye, good health, 